The death of civilians in police custody has perhaps never been as front and center as it is right now. And what to do about it has never been as prominent in our public conversation. But do we have the right kind of information that policymakers need to act and get it right? Rob Gillizzo is an assistant professor of economics at the University of Victoria. He went looking for just such data and what he found was not exactly inspiring. And he joins us now from Victoria, British Columbia, to explain. Professor, it's good to see you. How are you managing through this pandemic? Uh, I, you know, we're getting by. The toddler finally just went back to childcare, so uh, getting a little bit of work done now. I hear that a lot. Child care centers reopening is a, a absolute uh, celebration, re a reason for celebration, absolutely. Uh, you founded something, as we get into this, called the Racial Uprisings Lab. Just explain what that's all about, if you would. Yeah, so I, uh, I do a lot of my research uh, at the intersection of race, protest, uh, and police violence. Uh, and so uh, I started doing that work, uh, looking at the uprisings that happened in the 1960s. Uh, and those were uprisings that happened in response to largely uh, police brutality, police violence uh, against African-American civilians. Uh, so that data, that data already existed. Uh, and, you know, historical information is valuable. Uh, but we wanted to know, you know, what is happening with protests today? Uh, and is protest today working? Uh, and that data didn't exist. Uh, so my colleague, Jamie Cunningham and I, uh, he's at the University of Memphis, uh, we founded a lab uh, with the goal of digitizing all major uh, racial protest in the United States from 1990 all the way up uh, to 2017. You say only in the United States. Canada is not part of this? Uh, it is not. That is uh, somewhere that we would love to jump into. But uh, even if we collect, for example, if we collected data on Idle No More, something that I very much want to do uh, as a Métis person, uh, I don't have data I can link that up to, right? I can study, I can capture when and where the protest happens, but I can't necessarily link it to outcomes in the Canadian context because that data isn't there. Hmm. What got you interested in studying this to begin with? Uh, I, I'm an economist uh, who believes uh, in studying in studying my community, uh, studying things that my neighbors care about. Uh, and I did my, my doctoral studies at the University of Michigan uh, in Ann Arbor. Uh, and you know, I, I love Michigan. I grew up in Ontario. Michigan felt very much like home, but you know things were tough there. Uh, uh, Detroit is a city I love and I would spend uh, I'd spend a lot of time there as a graduate student. Uh, but things were tough. Uh, and I think everyone everyone knew that some of the difficulties went back. Right to some of those uh, some of those difficult times uh, in the 1960s, uh, and I was there, uh, living there for the 40th anniversary of, of the uprising in 1967, and you know I wanted to know how the, these huge uprisings happened. Right, uh, people stood up and said no to police violence, uh, and in many cases, right, the result was that uh, their own communities were damaged and burned down. Uh, but they, you know, that was done to send the message about the unacceptability of police violence. And so I wanted to study, you know, uh, did those uprisings work? Uh, did they send that message and was it acted on? Uh, and unfortunately, our results showed uh, the opposite happened. Uh, rather than leading to a de decrease in police violence, officers responded to these protests uh, in the 60s by actually killing more civilians in the years following. Hmm. Well, that, of course, was decades ago. And I have to believe that given your interest in this subject area, you must be watching what's unfolding over the last few weeks across North America with, uh, well, perhaps a tremendous professional interest and considerable personal angst and concern. Uh, but that's me putting words in your mouth. Why don't you tell us how you're feeling about it all? I mean, uh, over a thousand uh, civilians are killed a year uh, by the police in the United States, and they're overwhelmingly people of color. Uh, I, I think things feel different this time. It, it is horrifying. It is horrifying every single time it happens. Uh, but to have you know ten minutes of footage, uh, it I think I think it caused the public to take notice in a way that they haven't before. Uh, and the the protests that we're seeing sweeping you know not just the United States, not just Canada, uh, but the world uh, right are the biggest we've seen uh, since the aftermath of the assassination of Dr. King. Right. This this is an unprecedented. Uh, level of of, of uh, protest, uh, and you know, and media is covering it in a way like they never have before. Uh, in a way that, as a researcher, you know, it's fascinating. But but as a human being, it gives me enormous hope uh, that maybe things are going to be different this time. Rob, you have written a paper which I gather has not yet been published, but it's called "The Impact of Access to Collective Bargaining Rights on Policing and Civilian Deaths." Bit of a mouthful there, but. Um... 
but obviously hugely prescient given the times in which we live. Tell us about that paper and its findings. Yeah, so, you know, I, I did that early work on, on, on protests and police violence. Uh, and, you know, we found that was a part of the story, but it, it really was just a part of the story. Uh, and the United States, right, has seen this huge increase uh, in civilians killed by officers over the last half century. Uh, and so a, a popular notion, right, that you would hear uh, when, when I was living in the United States, and that you hear north of the border too, uh, is that, right, police unions play this role in limiting accountability uh, for officers who engage uh, in crimes against civilians, uh, who kill civilians, who hurt civilians. Uh, and so we, you know, we took a look around uh, and there really wasn't much evidence there. Uh, there is one nice paper uh, by uh, a team out of the University of Chicago uh, who have found some uh, evidence uh, with respect to brutality uh, in Florida, but th that was pretty much it. And so we said, you know, we, we can't go out uh, and, met and get every collective agreement, but what we can do is we can look uh, at when collective bargaining rights are granted to police, starting in the late 1950s, continuing through the 1980s, and we can figure out, you know, how do they change their behavior when they get access to those bargaining rights? Uh, I want to be careful how I ask this next question because I don't want it to sound insensitive, but the f I guess the fact is that unions, I mean, part of their job is to protect their membership uh, a, from capricious management, but also B, um, they do do a lot of defending of, well, teacher unions, for example, often defend bad teachers from getting fired. Uh, journalist unions prevent bad journalists from getting fired. That's just sort of part of the mandate. What's the difference between what police unions do on behalf of police officers who may be bad? Yeah, and, and I want to be upfront. Uh, I'm a union member right now. I'm on the executive for my faculty union. I believe that collective bargaining is a right. Uh, so we, we have some pretty troubling findings in this paper, but those findings don't say that people shouldn't have that ability to, bar to bargain. What's happening differently, uh, you know, there, you have the duty of fair representation that you referred to, right? The union has an obligation to represent its members, and that's a legal obligation. But what are police unions doing? There are bargaining elements of collective agreements that in essence create a parallel justice system that officers face. So for example, this can include uh, you know, if, if an officer is involved in the killing of a civilian, you would like to think that they would go and give a statement pretty rapidly and they would be interrogated. Uh, often these agreements include clauses that will require uh, the officer to agree to the time and location when that statement could occur, delaying it. It might guarantee a right to huddle with other officers on the scene to talk about, uh, uh, to talk about what happened. And it might even dictate what can happen in that room. It might, for example, require breaks every 20 minutes uh, it might uh, limit the type of questioning that can occur. Uh, so it fundamentally shifts uh, accountability within the system in a, in a way that is much more beyond what you would normally see in the collective bargaining process. Hmm. Do you know whether or not that, that takes place in the province of Ontario? For example, uh, if the special investigation unit is investigating a police shooting, do you know whether, for example, the Ontario Provincial Police Union or the uh, Toronto Police uh, Association, whether they have the powers you just enumerated to to affect the investigation that way? So there, there uh, I, uh, I haven't looked at those contracts recently uh, for Toronto. In general, in the Canadian context, uh, there is, again, a different system. It's usually articulated not uh, in the collective agreement, but rather in the Police Act. Uh, so, for example, in British Columbia, the Police Act is going to lay out uh, a process of investigation. Uh, the collective agreement will mainly say something relevant in a way that will shift behavior with respect to indemnification, right? Uh, officers certainly will, will have their costs covered going through this process. Uh, and so one of the main areas for reform we're hearing in the United States that would work very well in Canada would be applying, right, uh, basically officers themselves taking on some liability, such that if you repeatedly engage in violent acts against the public, your insurance costs will go up. So there's that little bit of overlap, but it, it, there are differences across the border. Okay. Uh, and again, I want to make sure that I'm super clear about the way I asked this question, but do, do you see a correlation between police unionization and increasing civilian death? Yeah, so, uh, you know, our, we do, uh, and it is significant and it differs by race. Uh, our prior when we went into this research uh, was that when, when officers gained access to collective bargaining, and I, I want to be precise that we're looking at the impact of getting bargaining rights rather than just forming the union. Uh, and this is about both sides of the table. Uh, but so when we went in, we thought, uh, you know, what's gonna happen, right? There are these situations where an officer is making the decision uh, to shoot. 
Uh, and on one hand, right, their personal safety is a concern and that leans towards shooting in a situation under which they're unsure. On the other hand, right, if they shoot someone uh, who is unarmed, uh, they could face consequences. Uh, and so, right, uh, at that margin, uh, uh, having a union, having things that protect the officer is going to shift the decision to shoot. But if that's all that's occurring, right, we would expect more civilians, regardless of race, to be killed. What do we actually find? We find that there is no change in the number of white civilians being killed by officers, but an additional 0.029 uh, non-white civilians per year, per county in the United States. So that's about 60 to 70 per year, but jumping back in time to the 1960s and 70s uh, are being killed annually uh, because of that change in bargaining rights. Uh, and that's a really, really big effect. Uh, okay, well, again, just because there is a correlation doesn't mean that their unionization directly caused the civil deaths that you talked about, right? Are, are, just so I'm clear, are you saying it was a contributing factor, but not necessarily the cause of those deaths? So we're, you know, economists today spend a lot of time on identification, uh, and we're, we're willing to make the causal claim here, because what do we do? We look at right, timing changes when bargaining rights are introduced state by state, uh, but then we actually narrow in on counties. Uh, and we say, you know, we have this county uh, at the border of Michigan and Ohio, one in, Mi one in Michigan, one in Ohio, and the law flips in one state. How do things change within that county pair? So we're using an extremely precise control group uh, to get causal estimation here. So I, I, I actually, I wouldn't just frame it as correlation. It, it does look causal. Now, but I think maybe the core of your question, what's the mechanism, right? Because it's, it's not necessarily uh, the union that's causing it, right? This is probably the result of a process, right? Bargaining is a two-way street. Uh, it is measures in the collective agreement uh, that are, are likely causing these effects. But the collective agreement is owned just as much by the employer as it is by the union. Hmm. Do, do you think the unionization of police services across North America has led to safer working conditions for police officers. Because I don't have to tell you, you know, we also, in, in police officers I've interviewed over the years, say that they occupy one of the few jobs in this society where when you walk out the front door, you never really know if you're coming home that night. So let's focus on that for a second. Yeah, I, uh, so we have, we're actually able to test that and we don't see any change in the number of officers being killed in the line of duty. Uh, and that was a surprising result because my prior had been, you know, we would have seen a modest decrease. Uh, but it looks like other factors relating to the increased use of force may actually be putting some additional risk onto officers uh, that counterbalance anything else going on. Uh, I want to be clear that that's a very narrow estimation, right? I'm not testing, for example, whether or not uh, officers are less likely to be injured. Uh, and I, I would be surprised, right, if the bargaining process wasn't resulting in some additional protection for officers. Hmm. What changes might be made to the way police unions function to make them work better for everybody? Yeah, I, to be honest, I, I think that both sides have an obligation to do better here. Uh, and I actually turn to the employer first. Uh, because right when you're sitting down at that bargaining table, uh, who's usually the employer, especially in the United States, uh, but in Canada too, right, it's typically going to be local government. Uh, and right, you are going to bargain over wages, you're going to bargain over pensions, other benefits, you're going to bargain over measures with respect to accountability. Uh, and what fits the political cycle? Well, if, if you give a bigger wage increase, you give a bigger pension, that's going to push up taxes, right? And municipal politicians don't want that. So what, what do we think has happened over the last 50 years and it's really driving this result? Instead of right, making concessions that are economic, local governments have opted to make concessions uh, that protect officers uh, in their ability to kill civilians, right? So at the bargaining table, we're, they're handing over things that make the public less safe. So what's my big policy takeaway? Uh, the employer, local governments should be coming to the table and making public health, public safety, particularly uh, for the black population and indigenous peoples front and center in the bargaining conversation. You use the word accountability in that answer, though, and, and this seems to be one of those areas where accountability is tricky. On the one hand, uh, sure, the police budget is the largest line item in any municipality's budget. Uh, in the city of Toronto, it's a, more than a billion dollars alone. Uh, but they don't run the police. It's the police services board that actually is responsible for overseeing police actions, but they're not elected. So we can't throw them out if we don't like the way they've handled things. 
And there may be some provincial policy involved here, but the province doesn't control uh, the Ontario Provincial Police, let's say, for example, either. Um, so accountability, kind of tricky here. How do we know where to go to try to get ultimate accountability? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's actually much easier to give policy recommendations in the American space. Uh, as a Canadian, uh, I think you need to turn uh, pretty much in equal part, right, to the province uh, and to your police board and your municipality, right? Because without those three bodies acting in tandem, uh, we're not going to be able to change things. Uh, and so we uh, pressure needs to be applied across the board. And, you know, I think we've seen time and time again that those three bodies uh, are going to have a tendency to pass the buck between them. Uh, and that is a political tactic. Uh, and that is something that the public, you know, to be honest, just shouldn't put up with. Hmm. What does your research tell you or where does it direct you uh, in terms of these three now very famous words we've been hearing over the last couple of weeks? Defund the police. Yeah, I mean, uh, as an academic, I think I think it's extremely important, right? To, it's our job to take ideas and to try to help turn them into something uh, that we can do. Uh, so when, when I think about defunding the police, you know, in, in terms of the rationale, right? If you are a Black Canadian, if you are an Indigenous person, uh, we know that you're not being treated equally, right? We know that uh, you are being made uh, less safe oftentimes uh, by this institution. So why do a lot of those folks want to limit funding there? Well, you're right, we have limited tax dollars and do you really want them primarily going to an institution uh, that is not treating you the same as your neighbor, right? Uh, that, 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 I think that's the origin. Now, what can it look like practically? Well, you know, police departments have core roles that they'll need to fill. Uh, but if this institution is failing people of color, uh, right? You can say, well, maybe you can have another institution that isn't. Right. And for example, we can take some mental health work that officers do and shift that out to institutions that don't have that same uh, that same history. Or you can even get creative. I, I saw an economist the other day uh, talking through what you could do with respect to traffic. Right. Uh, we've to some degree taken for granted that traffic stops are done by officers, but there's nothing that would stop a truly creative uh, local government from actually creating something independent uh, and separating those two roles. So it, it's not it's, I don't think it's about shutting down departments altogether but it's about moving responsibilities to institutions that will treat Black Canadians and Indigenous peoples the same as white Canadians. Hmm. Rob, do you have any idea whether or not police unions across North America are aware of your work or whether you've sent it to them to make them aware of it? Yeah, I've, I've uh, chatted with some folks and uh, to be honest, uh, conversations have been very constructive. Uh, the labor movement, uh, I think is working very actively here. Uh, there's been some outreach uh, within Canada. Uh, like. I think a really important historical piece of context here uh, is that you know, the labor movement is a force for tremendous good, uh, but it has had difficulties, right? It has had struggles. Uh, you don't need to jump back that long ago to a time when uh, locals were segregated, right? Where one half of the American labor movement was segregationist and the other half uh, was in favor of civil rights and they had a reckoning. Uh, and so I think that right, one, of the big, one of the big pieces here is that there are going to be people within police unions who want to tackle these problems, who believe they should be treated the same by the law, who care about the rights of Black Canadians and Indigenous peoples. And those folks, right, can, can get involved in their union. They can change the policy uh, and, they, and they can make a difference. Do you know them? Do you know who they are? Uh, I, wish I, I wish I knew more of them. I, I, you know, I, I know a handful, but uh, uh, it is not my place, right? Uh, unions are democratic organizations, uh, and it is up to those members uh, to carve out space in their own organization and make their voice heard. Hmm. Fascinating stuff. Rob, we're really grateful you could spare some time for us from Victoria, British Columbia. Thanks so much. Oh, an absolute pleasure. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.